Hi, my name is Young Kyu Choi. I'm a professor at Ina University, Korea. Uh, in this video, I'm going to teach a course named High Level Synthesis Programming with FPGAs. This is a quarter length course, and we're going to learn the details of high level synthesis programming. And uh, this is going to be a fourth year undergraduate or first year graduate level course. And I'm going to assume that you have a good understanding of your C programming and the logic design course. But it'll be even better if you have taken the digital system design or the computer organization course. Uh, before I begin, let me explain what we're going to learn and what we're not going to learn in this course. In this course, we're going to learn how to program a high level thesis or HLS code. We'll also learn various HLS optimization techniques to generate a high performance design. Then we'll generate an FPGA B stream from our HLS code and run it on an FPGA board. In particular, uh, we're going to use AWS F1 instance, uh, which is a cloud computing service provided by Amazon to run our FPGA B stream. Now, I would also like to tell you that uh, this is course is not about how to develop an HLS compiler or to build an FPA. This is a HLS user-oriented course, and it is not intended to be a guide for an HLS tool developer. Let me begin with the recent trend in the processor world. If you look at the processors being released last couple of years, uh, you will notice that many of them have custom accelerators on chip. Apple has released M1 SoC, which has accelerators for neural network and machine learning. Intel Lohi uh, has a spiking neural network accelerator. And the Google TPU is in systolic array architecture. It is well known that by embracing customization, uh, you can achieve high performance by consuming small amount of area and power. And that's why all major vendors are eager to add custom accelerators to their product. But is it easy to design a customized accelerator? If you look at the fabrication cost, hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent and the cost is rapidly increasing. So this really brings the need to automate the design process. One promising way to reduce the design effort is to use the higher level synthesis tools or HLS tools. It allows you to design in high level languages such as C or OpenCL, and the tool automatically determines the microarchitecture and generates low level designs. So it drastically reduces the design effort and leads to faster time to market. Because of such advantages, you can see that there is an increasing popularity of using HLS for customized chip design in academia. And also you can find many success stories in major companies such as Intel, Nvidia, or Google. Before moving on, let me show you a sample HLS code. This is a matrix vector multiplication code uh, we're multiplying matrix A and vector X and producing vector Y. These two loops uh, are just regular C code. You would have to run a matrix vector multiplication, one on the row, uh, one on the column. Uh, in HLS, you can keep this uh, original loop structure. Uh, if you want additional optimization, you can simply insert a pragma and the HLS tool will perform that optimization for you. Uh, with this pragma, uh, we are telling HLS that we want pipelining. And uh, it's not shown here, but uh, you can also uh, specify a pragma to unroll uh, certain loops. Uh, same on the interface. Uh, you can specify the type of interface you want on each argument, uh, like AXI uh, or FIFO uh, using a pragma. Now, there is a caveat. Uh, there are some coding styles that pref HLS prefers. Uh, for example, I have broken down the column loop into two loops. 
uh, this helps HLS to obtain a uh, higher parallelism. And um, it's not shown here, but I need to save the vector x into a local array for data reuse. Uh, I'm going to talk about these techniques uh, during the course of the lecture. But still, uh, you see that you only need about 20 lines of uh, code to obtain a decent matrix vector modification circuit. Uh, if you wanted to do that on Verilog, uh, this is the uh, traditional hardware description language, you'd need thousands of lines of, of code uh, just to inter uh, define the interface and another couple thousands uh, to implement the computation and the control code. The, ac the actual code is actually uh, quite scary to look at. So HLS really reduced the programmer effort in building custom accelerators. Some of you might be worried that the performance of HLS might not be as good as uh, very long coding. Uh, this is no longer true with the modern HLS compilers. Uh, in this uh, comparative study on DCT, uh, programmers using HLS uh, typically used a similar amount of area um, or resource and was able to run it more than two times faster. And if you compare the development time, um, uh, the, the HLS programmers uh, needed only two thirds of the time compared to RTL development. The reason development is shorter is because the code length is shorter. And the reason speed uh, is better is because HLS tools do a better job of optimizing the circuit at a high level uh, that fits the available technology and the platform. Uh, we'll talk more about this during the course of the lecture. The software we're going to use in this class is Xilinx Vitus software platform. It takes application code and transforms it into accelerators. Vitus provides various development tools to emulate, analyze, and debug the design. And the tool we're going to use most often in this class is the high-level synthesis routine in Vitus. But uh, we're going to use the whole software stack to perform various tasks. Uh, Xilinx Vitus HLS is actually the successor of uh, Vivado HLS. Uh, the Xilinx uh, changed the name into uh, 2020. Uh, it compiles, simulates, and debugs C, C++, or OpenCL functions, and generates RTL code. The biggest reason we use Vitus HLS is that it's by far the most popular HLS tool. Um, on one survey on 2018 shows that among academic papers that evaluate HLS and RTL, about one third of all papers use Vivado HLS, you know, the previous version of Vitus HLS. And uh, there was a large gap between the Vivado HLS and the second place HLS tool. So I can assure you that the tool we're going to use in this class is the most popular HLS tool in academia these days. The platform we're going to be using is Amazon uh, Web Service, or AWS F1 instance. Uh, the F stands for FPGA, or Field Programmable Gate Arrays. AWS is a cloud computing service, and we can conveniently use a remote server that has an FPGA without the hassle of maintaining our own servers. We're going to use the latest Vitus software provided by Xilinx and run our accelerators on board. Uh, not just simulation, but on board. And uh, we're going to learn how to do emulation, debugging, and the performance analysis of the generated circuit. Now, one question you might have at this point is that why are we using FPGAs for high level synthesis in this class? Isn't it also possible to use HLS for ASICs? Well, that's true, but uh, it typically takes uh, many months to fabricate an ASIC circuit. Also, the cost is extremely high, so we'll only be able to run a simulation for ASICs. FPGA, on the other hand, allows you to synthesize and reprogram a hardware circuit in a matter of hours. So we can actually run it on board and obtain a deeper understanding of the generated circuit. 
Thus, it's uh, much more ideal to use FPGAs uh, for the purpose of learning HLS. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, learn more details about the FPGA architecture a few slides later. The textbook we're going to be using in this class is titled Parallel Programming for FPGAs, uh, or in short, the HLS book. Uh, the whole text is uh, available online at this address. And the uh, authors of this book is uh, Professors Kastner, uh, Matai, and uh, Neuendorfer. Um, I am extremely uh, grateful uh, to the authors for open sourcing their textbook uh, for everyone to use. I have been supported by AWS Korea to open an offline lecture for this course. Uh, thanks to Chunghan Kim and uh, Yuhun Won uh, for setting up the environment. Also, this course has been developed in collaboration with uh, professors Chunghok Choi um, Jason Kong, uh, Jemma Fang, and Pei Pei Zhao. Uh, also, uh, thanks to In Sang Jun for collecting data on some of the slides. All right, so let's start with chapter one of the HLS book. Uh, the learning objectives of this chapter is to be able to explain the basic architecture of FPGAs and characterize the performance of an HLS design, and also be able to explain the difference between how CPUs and FPGAs uh, do the computation. Uh, as I explained before, HLS tool takes designs uh, written in high level languages such as C or C++ and generates uh, detailed microarchitecture uh, written in RTL uh, such as Verilog. Uh, this enables a designer to focus on high-level architectural questions uh, rather than having the headache of uh, assigning individual registers and scheduling operations uh, cycle to cycle. The output of Vitus HLS tool can be synthesized into a FPGAB stream uh, using the rest of the Vitus flow and uh, executed on FPGA. HLS can automatically do many things. Um, it can analyze and exploit concurrency uh, or parallelism uh, in an algorithm. It can automatically insert registers where there is a uh, lot of uh, operations and achieve uh, the desired clock frequency. Uh, generate control logic and interface, and map uh, data and computation to appropriate storage or logic elements. Uh, but compared to latest C compilers like GCC, um, HLS has a number of limitations. Um, it cannot support dynamic memory allocation uh, like a malloc. Uh, you cannot synthesize system calls like a printf, uh, no recursive function calls, uh, and the pointers and the standard libraries are allowed but limited. So for example, mass.h is supported but algorithm.h is not. Although vanilla HLS itself do not uh, support these functions, uh, there are certainly research works that allow you to do these things. Um, if you're interested in doing research on HLS, uh, I highly encourage you to search Google Scholar uh, with the keyword like uh, FPJ HLS and recursive call, for example, and you can see some latest work on these topics. Now, let's take a detailed look at the platform we're targeting uh, with our HLS tool, the FPGA. FPGA is an array of programmable logic blocks and memory elements that are connected together using programmable interconnect. The logic block is implemented as a lookup table, or also called LUT. It provides a mapping between the input and the output signals so that you will have the intended output for a particular set of input. For example, let's say that you want to implement an AND gate. You want to have output 1 when you have input 1 and 1 and output 0 when you have input 0, 0, 0, 1 or 1, 0. To achieve that, 
you can set zero on configuration bits one zero one and two and set one on configuration bit three so when you're executing this circuit the mux will choose the right value using the input signal as a select signal of the mux so when the input is one zero um, the output is zero because you have set the configuration bit two to zero the output of LUD is usually co-located with flip-flops, which acts as a memory element. You may choose to store the output of LUD or bypass it. The set of LUD, flip-flop, and MUX uh, is called a slice and is the building block of FPGAs. Obviously, uh, you're going to have many slices in an FPGA. Uh, the input and output of a slice are connected to routing tracks and the connection between a slice and the routing tracks are configured as a pass transistor. The routing tracks are grouped as a routing channel and they are connected to other routing tracks uh, through a switch box. So the slices are like the logic islands connected to the routing channels uh, in two dimensions. The routing channels uh, may be connected to north, south, or uh, west or east, depending on the switch box. The routing channels may also be connected to I.O. Uh, blocks to communicate with external devices like DRAM or CPU. So I think it suffices to say that uh, FPGAs allows you to customize computation, memory, and the interconnect between them. Let's solve a simple exercise. Please design a half feather uh, by assigning values to the LUT configuration bits. If you recall from your logic design course, uh, when you add two bits A and B, uh, the added value will be sent to the sum bit and the overflow to the next digit will be sent to the carry bit. So signal sum uh, represent uh, value one and signal carry uh, represent value two. Um, you can write down either zero or one on these eight configuration bits. And uh, you can pause the video here and proceed to the next slide when you're ready. All right, so let's solve the exercise. Since we're using A and B as the select signal of the MUX, uh, this input uh, corresponds to the case when both A and B are zero. This is when A is one and B is zero. Uh, this is when A is zero and B is one. And this is a case when both A and B are one. For the sum bit, it becomes one when only A is one or only when B is one. So the configuration bits are going to be zero, one, one, zero. For the carry bit, it becomes 1 when both A and B are 1. So the configuration bits are going to be 0, 0, 0, and 1. Did uh, everyone get that? Alright. Next, let's look at the FPGA memory resource. We have already looked at the flip-flops. Uh, FPJ also has a dedicated memory resource called block RAM or BRAM in short. Um, it is a random access memory uh, where you give an address signal and access a particular place in a memory. So you can pretty much think of it as a SRAM in a, inside an FPJ. And uh, BRAM may be configured in various ways. Lastly, uh, you can also ac access uh, external memory. Now, this memory is not in FPGA, 
but uh, sits outside the PGA. So let's look at the comparison table of these memories. Since uh, each flip-flop is uh, coupled with the LUTs, uh, you're going to have hundreds of uh, terabytes per uh, second of uh, uh, memory bandwidth to the compute resource. But the downside is that you only have hundreds of uh, kilobytes of them. Uh, for the external memory, uh, you can store several gigabytes of data, but you can also you can only have a few gigabytes per second of uh, memory bandwidth. So, uh, and the VRAM is somewhere between uh, these two uh, elements. So you usually want to store the data that is going to be uh, frequently reused in the VRAMs and the flip flops and put the rest of the data in the external memory. Now, uh, those of you who have taken the uh, architecture class, uh, you might be wondering, does FPGA have cache? Well, some FPGAs uh, have cache, but uh, most don't. Uh, most FPGA designers would rather use VRAMs uh, to manually control the data reuse or the locality. So rather than, you know, leaving the task up to an uh, unpredictable cache. So um, we'll see many examples of uh, how to uh, do this, uh, do the re -re data reuse in the later chapters. Now we are going to talk about the basic concepts of FPGA design optimization. But before we do that, uh, let's define some of the metrics related to performance. Uh, task latency uh, is the time between when a task starts and when it finishes. Uh, task interval, uh, or also called the initiation interval, or II, uh, is the time between when one task starts and the next one starts. Uh, let's look at an example. Um, this direction is time and uh, this direction uh, is different operations. Uh, so this might be add, um, this may be multiply, uh, this might be a shift, and so on. So we're assuming that it takes 10 operations to process a certain task. The task latency, or simply latency, is 10 cycles. Uh, if you want to process four batches of task, uh, it might take 13 cycles. Um, now, um, if you choose to wait until the previous one uh, task finishes, um, the task interval is going to be 13 cycles. Or um, another option is to make the design to start processing the task before the previous one finishes. Um, in this uh, particular case, uh, you're starting the second task uh, one cycle after the first task uh, starts. So the task interval is going to be one. And uh, in this diagram, uh, only four is drawn, uh, but you can imagine that several more tasks uh, will coming in every cycle. So latency uh, is like the time between uh, input and output. And the task interval is like the inverse of throughput. Now, um, those of you who have, who have uh, taken the architecture class, uh, you might be thinking, hey, this is like the five stage pipeline. Oh, well, that is true. Uh, the difference is that you no longer have to be bounded by the number five stages. Uh, the HLS tool is going to customize the pipeline stages depending on the area and throughput trade-off. So um, let's talk about that in the next slide. To have a better understanding of what HLS tool is doing, uh, let's look at a real-world example, uh, FIR filter. FIR filter uh, performs convolution 
uh, which is composed of a uh, multiply and add. So multiply and add. Uh, if you were to compute this in a pipeline risk processor, you would do instruction fetch, uh, multiply, instruction decode, execution, uh, write back, uh, followed by instruction fetch of add, uh, decode, execution, and so on. HLS, on the other hand, generates higher performance pipeline and parallel architecture. Uh, this is called a function pipeline. Uh, that is, we're not fetching instruction, we're not decoding instruction, we're pretty much doing the execution stage and the register access only. Uh, this allows you to have a very efficient circuit customized for FIR filter. Um, this diagram is the uh, circuit generated by HLS. Uh, this one is the uh, scheduling. For each task, we're going to do four multiplies and three adds and produce an output. Uh, we can do this every cycle. So the task interval or II is one. Um, this diagram assumes that we can do all the computation in one cycle. So the latency is also one. But uh, depending on the technology being used and the bit width of the data, it is probably more reasonable to think that the latency may be several cycles. Now the example we saw produces one output or one sample per cycle. But it is also possible to compute one tap of multiply and add per cycle. Um, this is the architecture. Uh, you're computing one tap at a time and time sharing the multiplier and adder. In this case, it is going to take four cycles to produce one output, so the II is four. So what's the trade-off here? By computing one tab at a time, your throughput just decreased four times. But area-wise, you use four multiplier and three adders in this version, but you're using just one multiplier and one adder in this version. So you're trading off area with throughput. What is the right decision for you depends on the circumstances, uh, whether you're resource bound or performance bound. But it is very difficult to make these uh, changes yourself and explore all the design points. This is where HLS is useful. HLS provides a relatively easy way of describing the architecture that meets your needs. Uh, we use something called a compiler directive and tell HLS to generate this version or this version. Uh, we're going to see some examples of this in the next chapter. Let's summarize this chapter. We learned that you can customize the computation of FPGAs using lookup tables or LUTs. And uh, not only you can customize the computation, but you can also customize the memory resource and the interconnect. And when characterizing an HLS design, uh, you should consider the task latency and the task interval, or also known as initiation interval or II. And finally, uh, HLS uh, creates a function a pipeline of operations. So that's it for the uh, introduction. In the next chapter, we're going to learn how to use AWS F1 uh, so that we can run experiments uh, on board. So uh, I'll see you in the next class.